Sacco, um, the uh, that, uh, well, this, uh, principle of statism uh, being so strong still, um, I was thinking, is, is, it, is this a big um, hindrance for entry into the European Union? Uh, because what we hear in the European Union uh, when discussing entry of Turkey is, uh, if at all, the uh, hindrance is uh, the human rights question. Um, so, is this a problem? Because, I mean, uh, there's a lot of privatization uh, going on and, and, and rise of privatization from the European Union. Um, but, um, so, this state would be a hindrance. Would it not? Is it is this discussed at all? And a little bit further along is um, the, uh, the discussion in Turkey has heard has now moved away from wanting to be part of the European Union and away from the European Union to be part of something else. Is that true? And it is what? Um, thank you for your question. The Kabbalah's principle of statism is definitely a challenge towards the EU process and you know liberalization of Turkey, but other principles as well. I mean, nationalism is also a very big problem. Secularism is a problem as well. And for example, secularism uh, principle does not only you know uh, limit the Muslim conservative practice of the majority; it also limits the minority. For example, Christians in Turkey have a problem with the secularism principle as well. For example, the Halki Seminary of the Ecumenical Patriarchate cannot be opened because uh, Turkish law doesn't allow any religious school, period. Religious schools can only be run by the government and the, and the graduates of those schools can only go to a theology faculty, that's by law. So you cannot have any private religious school, Muslims can't have it and Christians can't have it either. So secularism problem, principle is a problem for all, everybody, like all religious denominations and all different religions. So you need to liberalize all these principles, that's for sure. As for Kemalism, I mean, there are, I think, two types of Kemalists. There are what I call the progressive Kemalists, who would say, Atatürk took the best in his time, and now we are in a different age. We should take his basic idea of modernization and move on. They would be more open and supportive, uh, open to and supportive of the EU process. But the more common Kemalism is what I call the literalist Kemalism, which says Atatürk said this, period. You know, that's his, uh, that's his golden you know, uh, era, and the wisdom we get there is like eternal. That is definitely an obstacle to the EU process. And about the e mood in Turkey, about the EU, still there's a strong demand in Turkey to enter the EU. But Turks are a little bit disillusioned because they think Europeans don't want, don't want Turkey inside the EU, especially some Europeans. So I think uh, the enthusiasm in Turkey for jo joining the EU has been a little bit curbed by the fact that uh, some European countries, most notably France, uh, and to a degree Germany and Austria, don't look as if they will ever want Turkey to join the uh, Union. Kemalism has been imitated by in a few countries, most notably Iran. The, in the 20s, the Shah of Iran was a great fan of Ataturk, and he wanted to implement his, some of his reforms in Iran. He even went to extreme, like he ordered his police to rip women off from, you know, from their whales on the streets. Turkey had never went that, as far as that one. What you got in return in Iran was Khomeini. So, the this dichotomy between a very strict enforced secularism and a traditional religious identity created all sorts of you know, conflicts and rifts 
in different countries. In, in Tunisia, for example, there was Burgiba. He was also like inspired by the Kamal's idea. Uh, he was just you know showing up on TV, drinking lemonade in Ramadan, and telling his people not to fast during Ramadan because it makes them lazy. But national efficiency requires more work and so on. So this idea of imposed modernity uh, created you know a reaction on the other side. And I think it has not been fully implemented in any other country. Uh, and I don't advise them. They advise that they should. Uh, but it also has given a bad name for the idea of secularism. I mean, I, I make a distinction between secularism and secularity, and I'm, a, I'm, in, I'm in favor of secularity of the state, like a neutral state. But the idea that you can separate the state from religion uh, came to the Islamic world only in the Kamala sense. It meant that you should ban religious practice. You know, like, like close down religious schools, you know, ban headscarf and so on. That just, that just created, I think, more reactionary attitudes towards any sort of modernization. So in that sense, it might have been uh, like a factor which contributed to even the rise of radicalism in some parts of the Middle East. I, I don't really have anything to add. I was just going to mention that his, uh, that Atatürk's reforms were, were, more, were explicitly uh, copied by the Pahlavi dynasty uh, in Iran. And so I would, I would agree, it's, it, it, among others. Um, but I would, uh, I would agree with, with uh, everything that President uh, Rocco said, that, including the dangers of that kind of, uh, that kind of modern question. I would ask, it's actually going to be first book for you. Um, what exactly do we consider to be the proper role of Kim Mustafa as the founder of Turkey? And remember, keep in mind, he is not a flake Well, I think first we should note that Mustafa Kemal was the leader of the national war, uh, war of liberation to you know, save the country. But he was not the creator of that war. And there were other like generals, other you know, people who collaborated with him. Even before he started the war, you know, there were local organizations in Anatolia to defend the country from invasion. And there was actually the Congress of those local you know, uh, groups to defend the country from invasion. And Mustafa Kemal came. And then he, they said, yeah, you're a good leader. You know, you're a good general. You can be our leader. But, so that was not, he was not just the creator of, of because that that's kind of myth-making is very powerful in Turkey, that everybody was in vain and sleeping, and he came and sh shone us on the nation like a sun, which was not the case. But definitely, he was the number one leader there. The thing is, after the War of Liberation, what happened was that Ataturk, in the parliament, because the Ottoman Empire had a parliament, I mean, you know, Parliament with all sorts of members. Uh, some parliament members sympathized with his political views. They formed the People's Republican Party in 1923, which still lives on as the Kamalist Party. And his the people who didn't agree with him, main, people who were either more religiously conservative or politically liberal, formed this liberal conservative alliance and formed the Progressive Party. Taraki Paru Afrika, as it's called in Turkish, in 1924. So there were just two a party, two party system evolving. What happened was that Ataturk closed down the other party just six months later, and established a single party rule for 25 years. So then imposed his own ideology on the state as the only truth. I think he he would have been done a much better job if he didn't ban opposition. And he just started his life as a politician and you know, do his best for, for the country while allowing opposition to criticize him. And then we, maybe we would have got rid of some of the excesses of the Kemalist revolution. Uh, because there were all sorts of, I mean, there, since there was no criticism against it in the 30s, the revolution really got out of hand. I mean, they created race theories that Turks were the supreme Aryan race. 
and everything came from Turkishness, you know, in, in 10,000 years ago, and all those things. Um, I think that would have been a much more balanced political system. <clears throat> yeah, I largely agree. I would only want to add that, uh, first of all, it certainly, I certainly would never presume to, uh, in uh, addressing your question, I would never presume to uh, take the position of offering any, uh, be, being a crass or didactic enough to try to tell the Turkish people what kind of country they ought to have or uh, what, to, what sort of political arrangements they ought to, ought to make. So I just want to make that, uh, that very clear at the outset. Um, but also, um, I think that to, just to add to uh, something Mr. Akil brought up, um, Mustafa Kemal was coming out of a very long tradition of a state-directed modernizing reform. And in an interesting way, your paper kind of ended, ended or, or began or might ended in, in an interesting way with uh, <clears throat> with a centralizing project of Ottoman intellectuals and military men, highly influenced by uh, positivism, by by, uh, by Comte, um, that had this, uh, and they weren't alone in that. There were some, similar things were happening elsewhere in the world, South America especially. So this was a, sort of in the air, this kind of state-directed, uh, guided uh, kind of modernization. So that's uh, just one other uh, kind of uh, extra point I wanted to to, to mention to you. Also, last year, actually, at this very meeting, um, I gave a paper about one of these uh, sort of al alternate visions or voices for uh, Turkey, uh, Mehmet Javid Bey, uh, who was very interested in Adam Smith and Bastiat. Um, he was executed and, and he was by executed. Mustafa Kemal. Yeah. Uh, so there was, I think, a different kind of, I think that there, there was a, an interesting historical moment uh, that for one reason or another was uh, was missed. The other thing that uh, I'm very glad you pointed out was that the Ottoman Empire uh, did have a parliament. It had a constitution, so there there was material there um, on which uh, on which uh, uh, on which to build some sort of uh, republic. One symbolic effort of the Kemalist Revolution is the Hat Revolution of 1925. By law, bowler hat was made compulsory, and fez was outlawed, and people were executed. A hat with a brim. And people were executed for not wearing it. So, I mean, we didn't need to have that revolution. Today, nobody wears any sort of hat in Turkey. But you know, that some of the excesses could have been, I think, avoided if it was a system with some opposition allowed, but all opposition was crushed. The Tanzimat uh, reforms are the, that of the of the beginning uh, around 1839 or so uh, was, was one manifestation of this 19th century uh, movement to centra centralize uh, and then ultimately modernize the uh, the empire. And and yes, in some ways you can look at those reforms. One could look at those reforms as being very progressive. The people, the Ottoman statesmen and intellectuals who initiated them. Saw them saw themselves as progressive reformers, as did the Kemalists. Um, so my point actually wasn't so much to make any normative judgments about the uh, the actual um, whether these things were progressive or not, or anything uh, like that. I was just interested in exploring how the how the process of centralizing 
power in the state and actually um, centralizing and, and codifying these different previously existing legal structures end up creating exactly the opposite of what the reformers had in mind. So, uh, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, the, the and, and by the way, the, the point about the capitulations is a very good one, and I didn't bring that up because I thought that would have muddied the waters a little too much in what already was probably too ambitious a uh, project for such a short presentation. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the point, again, I was trying to make wasn't necessarily to say that these uh, reforms were progressive or not, but rather to point out uh, perhaps the, the inherent dangers of this kind of modernization or reform uh, directed centrally by a, uh, a sort of self, self-proclaimed self group of uh, reformers using the course of power of the central government. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, are you aware of the uh, tradition that regarded the modern state as an absolute arbitrary destiny? Uh, and it's so very typically uh, efforts to bring some of the Bulgarians to cut off the chains of certain servitude. Now, that doesn't seem to be entirely in accord with the facts. Uh, and, and I'm aware of the um, difficulty of that. Um, what, what is that uh, Greece throughout most of its history of independence, uh, an independent country, has seized on the verge of being a fair state. And uh, that throughout the who remained in the Empire of Greece in this area were considerably more prosperous than Greece in Greece itself. Um, however, is the tradition with which you are living in which I grew up in slightly false? And this is a question more from the philosopher. Um, can I have a third thing in false? So that it was there, I would uh, probably not have um, been one of the greatest fans. But we did give it a constitutional state um, from which further development was possible. So is the, as I said, is the tradition within which I grew up of the Ottoman state and the an absolute arbitrary despotism entirely false, or is there some truth there? Well. Uh, thank you for the question. I think the truth is always somewhere in between extremes, and I think uh, let me give you one example. The Greeks rebelled against the Ottoman Empire, like the Serbs, because they believed that they had a national homeland, and they did, and they wanted to liberate it. The Jews never did rebel against the Ottoman Empire. They actually loved the Ottoman Empire to the end, because Jews didn't proclaim a national homeland. Well, Zionism did at some point, but the Jews of the Ottoman Empire were actually fearful that the empire would collapse and you know they would be left to the mercy of these Russian Bulgarian you know Slavic you know Christians coming from the uh, from the Balkans so I think I would say my my well Dr. Menzel is definitely a much more bigger expert on Ottoman history than I am but my uh, my sense about the Ottoman Empire was that until the 19th century you didn't have national rebellions like the Serbian and the Greek ones because there was no idea of a nation And uh, so I think the Serbs and the Greeks and the Bulgarians did relatively well under the Ottoman Empire, especially at the time, because the Ottomans did not have a policy of forced conversion. And they just let those people live according to their norms, unless there was a rebellion or something. In the 19th century, with the French Revolution, you know, the idea of a, a state for every nation became widespread and it started to come to the empire. So in the western parts of the empire, the Greeks said, well, we have been under Turkish yoke for 500 you know, years or 400 years, but they didn't think that way a century ago because they didn't think themselves as a people. Uh, so that consciousness, I think, brought the disintegration of the empire, and that consciousness also made the Turks more and more nationalistic and suspicious of the minorities among them, which led to the catastrophe of the Armenians in 1915, the great massacres and you know expulsion of the Armenians, which was a product of the fall of the empire not the empire itself. I mean, the crumbling empire created that disaster. As for Ataturk, actually he did not bring a constitutional state. The constitutional state was there. I mean, the Ottoman Empire accepted a constitution in 1876. And, and in 1908. In 1908, there was a second you know, like, period of constitutional monarchy. 
he actually, he created a new constitution in 1924, which was interestingly less liberal than the one in 1920. Um, for example, it brought the definition of Turkishness into the uh, constitution, and also it gave the, consti the, uh, the parliament, which he dominated, full powers, all the powers to try, and so there were like tribunals to just deal with the enemies of the uh, revolution, and many people were executed, like Javid Bey, who was a, like a libertarian. Uh, so he brought a constitution, I mean, constitu you should look at the co content of the constitution. Right now, we're, we have a constitution, again, made by the Kamalist generals, which still blocks Turkey's modernization in different ways. My view is this, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was definitely a modernizer, no doubt about that. But modernity sometimes can be a good thing, sometimes can be a not very good thing, and that depends on, I think, the authoritarianness or the you know, liberalness of that modernity. And in Atatürk's time, I think the authoritarian side was much more emphasized. Uh, again, I don't have too much to add, except uh, to just that it might be of interest, especially to some people in the room, to note that the Ottoman Constitution, um, of 18, uh, 1876 that was then reinstated in 1908 was um, uh, almost word for word a translation of the Belgian Constitution. Um, so what everyone thinks of the Belgian Constitution of what was 1830, I guess. Uh, that, that, but that was the Constitution they were, the Ottoman uh, Empire used was basically the, uh, the Belgian Constitution. Uh, again, I don't have too much to add except to say that, um, uh, that one of the things I was trying to explore in my own uh, remarks was just was, in a way, your question, uh, but also um, uh, the points that uh, Mr. Ockville brought up, that I think that something, ha what happens in the 19th century is an interesting combination of these uh, foreign ideas, ideas of romantic nationalism and the Enlightenment coming in uh, from students the Ottoman Empire had sent uh, to Europe. They bring these ideas back. And what's interesting is they find in the Milets, which were, in the night, which were basically established in the 19th century, these sort of ready-made vehicles for the transmission of these ideas. So they convert these institutions, the new institutions, um, really into um, embryonic national uh, states or national projects. It's also interesting that the Ottoman authorities wanted the new to have constitutions um, even before uh, the Ottoman Empire itself. Um, uh, officially had around the 1860s. And these constitutions were written generally not by the clerics, but by these young uh, uh, nationalists coming back from Europe, who then used the constitutions of these millets as a way of, of basically thinking about them as in national terms as opposed to religious terms. And then once you start thinking about nations, then of course they need a, state, they need a homeland, right? They need a state. Um, I'm not sure how to answer the other part of your question. You know, I, I did I did say that I wasn't trying to, um, I mean, I'm not, um, there, there certainly were all sorts of abuses in all of these systems. Um, uh, so I'm not trying to say that, uh, you know, like, like some people, like some people do, by the way, say that uh, the Ottoman Empire, especially under Sultan Suleiman, was some kind of interfaith paradise and, Everyone, you know, we're not hugging one another all day. And, uh, it was, uh, or, or, you know, it, I mean, it, it surely wasn't. Um, uh, and there surely were um, uh, built into the system various kinds of, um, of power relationships, in part based on religion. What I thought was so interesting from some of these court cases is that it suggested that the uh, that the segregation between the communities was not nearly as uh, as as powerful as has been imagined. With the mass of oppressed Christians kind of groaning under a uh, under a, an unmitigated Ottoman tyranny, um, and it also suggested that there were some there were some Christians in this world, uh, in this pre nineteenth century Ottoman world, who were pretty powerful, who could stand up to powerful Muslims in the establishment and win in the Sharia court. Um, so again, I'm not sure if I'm entirely answering your question, but uh, it's a, it's a so one interesting that. point I just want to add upon to your actually speech which is very good about Sharia and sometimes Christians finding Sharia useful. In uh, the ninth Ottoman Sultan, Yavuz Sultan Selim, who was like, a, it was the grim, like a you know, heavy handed Sultan and he did some massacres of Shiites in the East and so on. He at some point decided to convert all Christians to Muslims so he can rule the empire better, like more you know, neat empire, everybody. The Sheikh al-Islam said, you can't do this, this is against the Sharia. 
So there, because there has been time, because it, it is forced conversion is not, you know, it's banned in the Quran actually. I mean, there's another problem about apostasy, but you know, forced conversion is not uh, an Islamic practice. So uh, this was one thing I just want to add. And the second thing is when the uh, Ottomans gave equal citizenship rights to Christians and Jews in 1856, the Islahat Ferman, this was the second step after Tanzimat. Because before then, they were second-class citizens. They were protected, the Zimmis, but they were, did not have the equal rights. Um, some Christians didn't like it because it also meant that now they have to serve in the military. Before that, they were just paying a lot of some extra tax, but they were you know, free from military service. Not to quibble, but no one was a citizen. There were no citizens at all. Well, no, so citizen, but citizen. equal... Equal okay, rights. It's just, but it's an, anyway, it's just a, yeah. because it implies a kind of a, a different kind of demo, a constitutional democratic order. Okay, sorry, so I to your wisdom on that. Of, uh, the Sultan. Yeah, but equality was brought to all citizens, equal like uh, things, and that include the. I mean, if taxes were equal, and they had to serve in the military like Muslims did, but you know some were not happy about that. So the system had sometimes advantages and disadvantages, uh, and also that was the system. But otherwise, I mean, you had a like a tough sultan who just, you know, there was a rebellion and they, you know, pr uh, like suppressed rebellion with very bloody methods. That's something else. But I think the general system, or I mean, it, to use it very, you know, euphemi like a pejorative way, the system was, I think, uh, relatively uh, preferable to non Muslims. And that's why, especially the Jews, preferred the Ottoman Empire. So in fact, they, even the military service was so unpopular that the Ottoman authorities had to institute a special tax. It was available only to the Christians that they could buy them, and Jews that they could buy themselves out of the military. Yeah. Okay, last question. Abu Jerry also brought an end to the Caliph after the Muslim world, the Muslim world, the Muslim world. So I have a very hypothetical question. Is there some kind of tradition and theoretical possibility of a restoration of the Caliph or do we consider the international conditions and procedures? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a very. Uh, this is a political question, if I will. A good question. Thank you. I don't think so. I mean, first of all, the caliphate is uh, its a political institution. And it was established after prophet, the, the prophet died. And, you know, Muslims, just by arbitration, they said, let's have a successorship. And it went on. It's a, unlike like the role of the Pope in Catholicism, it's not that integral to the faith. I mean, if you don't have a caliphate, you're just totally lost. I mean, it's not that way. It was more of a political role than a you know, religious role. Uh, and when he abolished it, um, I think it had bad consequences in the sense of like leaving the Sunni world totally chaotic. Uh, but I don't see in the like, future any like, chance of establishing uh, the caliphate because it was just transmitted, but now how do you reestablish it? I mean, the best thing the Muslim world could establish was the Islamic you know, conference, the organization of the Islamic conference, uh, but, but I don't think anyone has the authority to right now say, I'm establishing it here, but they will say, who are you? I mean, uh, so I think we will be in a chaotic world in that sense for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very new concern. <laughs>